Good morning. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. Uh, This is Sunday morning. On Wednesday evenings, we are, because I'm doing a live broadcast at the same time that I'm recording this, on Sunday evenings, we are in the New Testament. On Wednesday evenings, we are in the Old Testament. And on Sunday morning, we are doing a variety of things. Uh, This morning, we're talking about Holy Communion, but we're going back down to the very beginning, which starts at the Exodus. And um, I'll be giving you instructions so that if anybody would like to take communion with us next Sunday, today is February 8th, so a week from today, Sunday morning, if you don't have a way of taking communion and you would like to, uh, I'll give you directions on what you need to prepare in order to do that next week. I don't have a calendar in front of me, so I can't give you that date. But it's, today is the 8th, so it will be a week from today, Sunday morning. Uh, our program begins on the West Coast at 10 a.m. and on the East Coast at um, 1 p.m., one, uh, 6, 6 p.m. in the U.K., and 7 p.m. in Central Europe. We're going to begin uh, today with some a little information about how the Passover began. Because when Jesus celebrated, uh, some people call it the Eucharist, the Last Supper, Holy Communion, the Lord's Table, those are all names for the same celebration that Jesus celebrated with his disciples and said that we should, in memory of him, celebrate from time to time. Uh, Jesus celebrated the Feast of the Passover with his disciples. And at that time, instituted Holy Communion or the Lord's Table, the uh, um, that which we do in remembrance of him and what he did for us. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. He was the favorite of his father. Um, he was the youngest His dad made him a special coat. He was also very blessed of the Lord. He had dreams about how one day he would be a leader over his brothers. And of course, they didn't like to hear about his dreams or his interpretations about them. They thought he was stuck on himself. And he went down to check on his brothers. They were working as herders very much the way little David did when his brothers were in the military and he went to visit them on behalf of his father and the family. While he was there, they had about all they needed of their little brother, having dreams that one day his brothers would bow down to him. They didn't need any more of that. And they decided they would sell him They saw a caravan coming with people who were uh, going from one place to another, selling things, and uh, they sold him into slavery. He wound up uh, in the palace in Egypt, and because God used him in dreams and so forth, there was an occasion when the king needed to have something interpreted. And it, he came to the king's attention, and before long, uh, God taught Joseph that there would be a period of seven years when the country would have a lot of food, and then they would go through seven years of famine, and they needed to save some of the food from those seven years of plenty for those seven years uh, 
when there would be famine. Because God had used him and given him this information, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, put him in charge of the whole program. He was the second most important man in all of Egypt. And sure enough, the time came uh, when in Egypt things were pretty bad. And his father sent his brothers to go to Egypt, to go to the Pharaoh, to see if they could buy food, because there was no food to buy in Israel. Now, years had gone by. You know, if you're 20 years old, and you don't see anybody, let's say, for 10 years, and you see them in their 30, you're probably going to recognize them. But if you see a 20-year-old you haven't seen since he was 10, it's not likely you're going to recognize him. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. He had been a boy, and now he's a man, and they don't recognize him. Finally, this isn't the time or the place to retell that story. But finally, the family comes over, and because they are herders and not fishermen or farmers or metal workers, there's a land not that far from the palace. It's called the land of Goshen, and it's very good for sheep herding. And so the whole family, about 90 of them, uh, his brothers, his father, their wives, their kids, they all went to the land of Goshen and they lived there and everything was fine. As the years went by, that Pharaoh died. Joseph died. His brothers died. But here we have all of these Jewish descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob's family living in Egypt. They're not Egyptians. They're very healthy. They reproduce they, very easily. They have lots of children. And the then leaders of the country thought, what are we going to do if we ever get in a war with anybody? And they managed to get these Jews on their side. They're going to win the war. So how do you conquer a people? How do you keep people from rising in society? Well, you make slaves of them. And so the Egyptians that were in charge at that time made slaves of the Jews that were there at that time. 400 years went by, and God sent Moses to deliver them. Moses showed up, went to the palace, talked to the Pharaoh, told him who he was. Of course, they knew. Um, he said, I want to take the Jews out for a few days so they can worship God. But we want to leave Egypt to do it. You know the story of the ten plagues. Pharaoh said, okay. But when it came time for them to go, he changed his mind and said, you can't go. So God sent a plague. When Pharaoh saw that, and there were a number of them, in one of them, all the water turned into blood. In another one, Everybody had head lice, including the animals. There were nine plagues, and they became more severe. But each time, when it came time to leave, the king would change his mind and say, you can't go. So we are now up to the tenth plague. And this foolishness, this king changing his mind, this has to stop. 
we're in the 12th chapter now of the book Exodus. And Exodus, you know what an exit sign means. Exit sign means go through this door, you exit, you leave here. Exodus is the Jews leaving the land of Egypt after uh, they, and by the way, they're not a family anymore. They're a nation. There are thousands of them. Ninety people went in, but 400 years have gone by. And they are healthy. And they are productive. And now they're a great nation. Twelfth chapter. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to the be going to be the beginning of months for you. In the first month of your year, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they must select an animal of the flock according to their father's households. In other words, each household, the father, would select an animal. Each father of each household. The person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to that each person will eat. Uh, as we go on with the rules, and I see we're being featured, as we go on with the rules, one of the rules was they must finish. They're going to eat a meal, and after that meal, they're going to escape. And eventually the king is going to try to change his mind again, but it's not going to work this time. He gives them rules on selecting the animal, how it's to be prepared. One of the rules is nothing will be left over. The entire animal must be eaten. Nothing can be thrown away. So if you had the right size family, then each family would have one animal that would be slaughtered and sacrificed. Now this whole process is looking forward to what eventually Jesus is going to do to rescue not only the Jews, but eventually the Gentiles when we would come into the picture. Uh, this is sort of a type or a picture of what's going to happen. If it was a very small family and they weren't going to be able to eat the entire animal, then they would get together with another family. You must have an unblemished animal. Couldn't be sick. A lot of people think, well, if I've got to give an animal and it's going to be sacrificed and it's going to die, let me give one that's sick anyway. But see, this was a picture or a type of Jesus. And Jesus was God's very best gift, his own son. And so you don't just give an animal ready to die. I remember when we were in a little town called Antonito, Colorado. And we had our dog with us. Um, our dog had never... It was a large dog. He was a little bit bigger than a German, was part German Shepherd, a little bit bigger than most German Shepherds. One man's sheep was found dead. And he asked us if our dog had done it. Well, we didn't see anything happen. And beside that, our dog was gentle he protected anybody that tried to steal anything out of our car or to hurt us but we've never known him to harm an animal and we said we don't think so and he said well this is the difference he said if your dog killed the sheep um the dog was vaccinated the death was recent, the meat would be good. But if the dog, if the, the sheep just died, he could have a disease and that meat wouldn't be good for them to eat. 
And if it had been killed by another animal that might be diseased, that animal might have bitten into it while it was still alive and some type of poison or something gone throughout the body. So they really were kind of hoping that our dog had killed uh, the animal and it would be then food for a few days. But we had no way of knowing that. When we give something to God, we give the best we have. This was to be an unblemished, not an animal with a spot, pure, uh, not one that was sick, not one that was skinny, the very best animal you could find. A year old male, you can take it from either the sheep or the goats, Jews, Gentiles. You were to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Now, he was telling them this at the beginning of, of the month. Now, on the 14th day, they had no idea what was coming. He said, on the 14th day, the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. Just at twilight, each household will slaughter the animal. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two door posts and the lintel of the houses in which they'll eat them. So you have a house. Your house has got a, a door. Well, I actually found a picture. Your house has a, let me turn it around. Your house has a door. You're going to take the uh, blood from the goat or the sheep and you're going to put it like uh, on a weed, probably hyssop. Uh, I should have brought a plant with me. And uh, you put the blood on it and you sprinkle it. So when you do this, some of it will get on the door. It was to go on the door posts and across the top. They are to eat the meat that night. This was at twilight, just in the morning, the slaughtering was to be done. They are going to eat it that night. It should be, it has to be cooked a certain way. And when I give you instructions on preparing for Holy Communion, you'll notice that they'll be specific. Because they mean something. The blood meant something. The fact that it was a whole family meant something. The fact that if they were inside of the house that had the blood on the door, it meant something. So they had to be very specific because everything had meaning to it. So it would be um, me back up. They were to take the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Herbs are vegetables. Bread without leaven does not rise. Cakes rise. Um, biscuits rise. Some rise more than others. We like the ones that rise a lot. And if you like the rolled over dinner rolls that I like, very light, then they really rise. I buy them already made. I don't start from scratch. They're in the refrigerator. I like once in a while to have bread that's fresh. So I buy these things when they're on sale and you can keep them in the refrigerator for two or three months. And then every once in a while I do it fresh and they rise. They're, they're light. They're delicious. They soak up the butter. This was not to have any yeast in it. And also there was a reason for that. Do not eat 
any of raw or uh, any it raw or cooked in boiling water. Only roast it over the fire. Can't cook it the way you want to, because everything has meaning. The head of it and the legs and the inner organs uh, do not eat any of it, do not allow any of it to remain until the morning. You're going to eat it in the evening. But it must be, it, it, there can be no leftovers. Here is how you must eat it. This is how they're going to partake of the meal. They're going to be dressed for travel. You know they wore inner garment, guard, uh, garments and outer garments and then sometimes coats, depending on the weather. They were to have, this is how they're going to eat it now. They're going to come to the table with their inner garments and their outer garments on. They're going to have their staff in their hand. Uh, I don't have my cane handy. That's the closest I have to a staff. It meant they're going to travel. It meant that when you travel, you come to a high place, you're going to need your pole. Stick it in the ground. Help it get you up a step. Sometimes uh, I had guests uh, Friday uh, here at the lake. And uh, the dock where the Arrowhead Queen docks, something the matter with their dock, and they had it docked someplace else. I needed two canes in order to get down the ramp because uh, it was a make-do type thing. They were going to meet, eat, with pure, uh, totally dressed, with a staff in their hand. You're going to hold a staff in one hand, and with the other hand, they're going to eat. They're to eat in a hurry, just as fast as they can. It's the Lord's Passover. Now, in every language, when you translate the word Passover, it doesn't always come out as nicely as it does in English. In Spanish, Passover translates to Pascua, another name that the people know that that word means this particular celebration. But in English, Passover meant literally that an angel would come, would see the blood, and would pass over, and there would be no death in that home. I will pass through the land. This is God telling Moses to tell the people. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. I'm coming, and I'm going to take the firstborn of the king's sons, the firstborn of every animal, every female that has had a litter, the firstborn male will be killed. Both man and beast, I am the Lord, just in case you needed to be reminded of that. I will execute judgments against the gods of Egypt. Tonight, when we uh, do our program on the first chapter of Romans, there are two activities that the Apostle Paul talks to the Romans about. One is their failure to see his divine order 
uh, and the nature, the naturalness of the fact that they were serving idols when nature itself should have been enough to teach them that somebody created all that. And then he goes from that being natural, going into the uh, thing which will be the, the main subject of our second program today, um, lesbian and gay preferences. So tonight's will be a matter of um, executing judgment because in part of Egypt's gods, when Paul writes to the Romans, it's a matter of the gods of the Romans. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See, they didn't get killed because they were Jews. They were not going to be saved from death because they were special. They were going to be saved from death by following God's instructions, which were put blood on the doorposts. And when the death angel sees the blood, the blood on that door is going to save the life of the firstborn. No plague will destroy you when I, dis dis when I strike the land of Egypt. But not because they were God's special people. This is their first experience as a nation. Until now, they've just been a bunch of families. Now they're a nation. Not because they were God's chosen nation, but because they obeyed in every detail. This day is to be a memorial for you. That's what Jesus said when he celebrated with his disciples. This is a memorial dinner. He said, this is going to be a memorial for you. You're going to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You're going to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statue. As long as there is a Jew alive. And this was couple thousand years before Christ. We're a couple thousand years after Christ. Four thousand years have gone by. They continue to do this. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. He's told them, see this is much before any of this was going to happen. Uh, they hadn't gone and asked, Moses and Aaron hadn't gone and asked Pharaoh yet. Uh, if they can go, he hasn't said yes yet, and then later changed. None of this had happened. But he said, for one week before this is going to happen, you're going to do this on the 14th. But for one week, you're not going to have any leaven bread in your house. Leaven is what makes bread rise. Biscuits, cake, most loaves of bread like this right here, it's soft. It started out flat, but it has leaven in it. It has yeast in it. And because of that, before it was put into the oven, it was set out. Now, I didn't make it. <laughs> okay. uh, but it was set out, and it would rise. And the leaven, the yeast, makes it rise. Said, now, bread that doesn't have yeast is flat. A uh, flour tortilla. You go to a Mexican restaurant here in California where I live, and 
ask you, you want flour tortillas or corn tortillas? Because most Mexicans prefer corn tortillas, and most from this side of the border prefer flour uh, tortillas. Uh, I'm not speaking of the corn, uh, because that's a matter of a vegetable from which a flour has been made. But speaking of the flour tortillas, they're white. Some of them are small, and some in the state of New Mexico and Colorado are huge. I've seen them. Some of them, one tortilla serves the whole family for the whole day. You put it at the table, and everybody pulls off a piece whenever they want it, and it lasts the whole family all day. But it doesn't have leaven in it, so it doesn't rise. So you've got a flat tortilla. Probably the three kinds of foods that I use and probably most Americans use when it to a um, I used to be able to get matcha bread. They used to sell it in the 99. Well, I don't know what's the matter with the bird downstairs. I may shut him up between programs here, maybe. Um, I, I love it. It's very flavorful, and it is Jewish bread. But for me, it's a um, it's a different taste. Uh, it's a cracker, and um, it's divided like you know most crackers. You get for soup are divided. You can divide it into four smaller ones. Um, that's what most people use, and that's what most people use for communion. An alternative to that, if you have matzo bread, I I like the taste of it. It's it's a different taste, and I just happen to like it. Or, of course, the white tortilla. Just white bread that is flat, that doesn't rise. Uh, he said, you're going to eat that for seven days. No biscuits, no cakes, no breads. Um, on the first day, you must remove yeast from your houses. Uh, I know we tend to want to substitute things. That's why I'm very careful when I give out, give out directions on how people should prepare for, uh, for Passover. Uh, I'm wondering. Just a minute. I'm going to check something. Okay. I thought the picture going out on iVlog wasn't very good, but it was actually, it was okay. It was, it was my screen that wasn't in the proper position, excuse in Persian. He said, just so we don't have a mistake, so you don't forget and put in the yeast or the kids don't want to help in the kitchen and they just get it out of the house. Sometimes that's what we have to do. Yeast in the Bible always stands for sin. And when he's saying for seven days you're going to have bread without yeast in it, you're going to be eating something with no representation of sin in it. Don't make substitutions. Don't even allow yourself to make a mistake because any of us can make a mistake. Don't allow yourself to make a mistake. Don't even have the yeast in the house. Um, you must remove yeast from your houses. Whoever eats what is leavened from the first day must be cut off from Israel. You're not going with Israel. You follow the directions. You do what you're told. Or you're not one of us. It's like that with Christianity. How many people would like the benefits of being a Christian but don't want to follow all the rules? How many people do you know that want to mix it up? Well, I'm a believer. I want to accept Christ's death on the cross as a substitution for me paying for my sins, but I sort of like doing some of my things that I do. They're fun. I like them. If you don't keep that rule for those seven days, if you eat it, you're no longer part of us. You are to hold a sacred assembly on the first day 
and another sacred assembly on the 7th. You're going to have church. You're going to have a meeting. An assembly is when a group of people get together. No work may be done on those days except for preparing what people need to eat. You may do only that. I know early in my Christian days, of course, that would be like, you know, 75, 80 years ago, Christians tried to do everything they could on Saturday so that the only work they did on Sunday was what had to be done. In other words, if the, the car wasn't full of gas, the husband would take it out Saturday night, put gas in it. There's nothing in the Bible that says you have to do that in the New Testament, but just out of sort of respect, I guess, from the way things were in the Old Testament, they would get gas. They would cook as much of the food as they could. Some things can't be cooked until the last minute, but they would do as, as much as they could. No work may be done on those days except for preparing what people need to eat. You may do only that. And I can't express too much how important it is that when God gives us rules and directions that we follow them exactly as they are. It's, it's not for us to bargain with him how we want to be saved. He gives us that. We follow his directions. You're to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread because on this very day I brought your ranks out of the land of Egypt. You're going to be doing this exactly as I tell you because you're going to be for all your generations, your kids, their kids, their kids, their kids, your great, 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 great grandchildren will be doing this. So don't make mistakes. It is a permanent statute. It is a rule. It is a law. It's going to be forever for all Jews. You are to eat unleavened bread in the first month from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day. Seven days. Yeast must not be found in your houses for seven days. We don't want accidents to happen. Why? Because the penalty was too serious. You ate leavened bread, you're out of there. You, you, you're, you're not going to escape from Egypt when, when, when the whole nation goes. So it's not worth it. Even doing something as a mistake. Just be careful. Don't let mistakes happen. If anyone eats something leavened, that person, whether a foreign resident or a native of the land, sometimes Jews have visitors. Uh, like sometimes people come and visit me. They may not be of my faith. Uh, and Jews had non-Jews visit them sometimes. But it didn't make any difference. There's a non-Jew in your house. He's going to be Jewish for the season. Uh, whether he's a foreign resident or a native of the land, must be cut off from the community of Israel. Do not eat anything leavened, eat unleavened bread in your homes. Then Moses summoned all the elders, and he said unto them, Okay, go select the animal from the flock. Take a cluster of hyssop. Hyssop is a weed. It's a weed that when you see pictures now of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem and you see a plant growing out from among it, it's a weed. It's um, The leaves on it are about the size of my hand. I have some plants here, actually, I could have brought if I would have thought it. And if you dip anything on it, you can shake it. So he told them what kind of weed to go get. Hyssop. Um, Moses said, take a cluster of hyssop, dip it in the blood that's in the basin. Because when you kill the animal, you're going to let the blood come out of the veins. You're going to collect it in a basin. And you're going to brush the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood in the basement, uh, in the basin. 
So in some cases, you're going to sprinkle it, but you can also, now you're not going to make it like paint, but you can, you can do this by sprinkling or you can, you can brush the blood on the doorpost. None may go out the door of the house until morning. Your only safety, your only way to keep from dying was to be in the house. We have to be inside of the plan that God provides for us. We stick our head out to see what the neighbors are doing. That's it. You're out. It's his way or the highway. When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, he will pass over the door and not let the destroyer, the death angel, enter your homes to strike you. Keep this command permanently as a statue for you and your descendants. It's going to go on forever. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, oh man, that's going to be a long time. They're going to go down through the uh, peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula. When they get to that seventh part, Moses is going up on the mountain and talk to God. they got a long way to go. And then after Moses gets the law and they build a tabernacle and they set up the priests and the high priests have their garments and the other priests and they've got everything all ready to go and then they get ready to go in it at the border, which the name of it is Kadesh Barnea, and they decide not to go, then God says, okay, you don't want to go. It's going to be 40 years ago. All that is still ahead of them. They've got a long road ahead of them, but it's going to start on a given time, and they're going to be preparing for it for a week. They're going to select the animal, then start the week of unleavened bread, and then cook the meal, not roast, uh, roasted, not, not boiled, roasted. He promised you are to observe this ritual. When your children ask you, this happens every Friday night. I used to give piano lessons to a boy and a girl who uh, were from a Jewish family. And I was teaching at a Bible college, so they couldn't come to where my piano was. It was in the chapel of the college. So I would travel and get piano lessons in people's houses to make extra money. And it just happened that my appointment with them was Friday night, and it was about 4 o'clock, and I'd give a couple of half-hour lessons. So about 5 o'clock, it wouldn't be that long. It would be dark. And when it got dark, it was then the Sabbath. So I had to keep my piano lessons brief and to the point and at the time she was setting the table and getting the Seder every Friday night getting it re ready what does this ritual mean to you the children are going to ask now what they do uh, the children are set now uh, every family does the Passover once a year uh, they do most families uh, or they should be doing this every Friday night at the regular Passover, the oldest son, they're sitting there, the oldest son, then the next, then the next, then the next. The other side of the table, the girls. Mother down here, father or grandfather, whoever is the oldest male there, is over here. They're set that way. The oldest one says, what does this ritual mean? It's usually father. What are we doing here? Why are we seated in this fashion around this table? That's still done. That question is asked. I was invited about 10 years ago by a Messianic Jewish Christian church to celebrate with them. Uh, and you were to reply. When your son says, why are we doing this? You're going to say, uh, 
it's the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he, when he struck the Egyptians and spared our homes. So the people bowed down and worshipped. This is, remember, they had an assembly the first, uh, on the 14th, the first of that week, and then on the 21st, the end of it, again. So the people bowed down and worshipped. Then uh, the Israelites went out and did this, and they did just as the Lord commanded them. Now, this is the actual Exodus, verse 29. Let me get another sip of my diet. Um, At midnight, the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoners in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he along with his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt. You can imagine. Every household you knew, firstborn son, was killed. And then you go out in the barn. If you have any pets in the house, firstborn, male. Because there wasn't a house without someone being dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Get up, leave my people, both you and the Israelites, and go. Worship the Lord as long as you ask. Well, at first they asked for a few days. Then they asked for a little bit more. Of course, the whole attention was from the beginning. They were getting out of there. Even take your flocks, because originally he had said, Just the men go. And then later on during these ten plagues, Well, okay, the men and the women go, but leave your animals. And finally he said, whatever it takes, it, all of you, it, take your flocks, your herds, whatever you want, leave. This will also be a blessing to me. Now the Egyptians pressured the people to order them quickly out of the country. They couldn't get rid of them soon enough. For they said, we're all going to die. If God's going to start doing this now, who knows what he's going to do tomorrow. So the people took their dough before it was leavened. Now they had done the one week of unleavened bread. But they had more bread and they didn't have leaven in it so it couldn't rise. So before it was leavened, they took that and their kneading bowls. You know, you've got to do this with it and you knead it and you put it out and then you do this more and you hit it with your knuckles. And they wrapped up the bowls in the clothes on their shoulders. I should have brought uh, a shawl. But they took the bowls with the bread in it, wrapped it up, and then wrapped that. You've probably seen women carry their babies that way or carry a package that way. And they, they wrapped it up that way, and that's the way they left the country. The Israelites acted on Moses' words and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. <laughs> this is chutzpah. This is nervy. Uh, but God told them. See, the people liked the people. The leaders were concerned that in case of a war, the Jews would be stronger than them. And they were healthier. And from a national point of view, they wanted to be able to control them. But as far as you like and your neighbor, they liked each other. Uh, there used to be places in the South where blacks and whites were not supposed to be friendly. But they liked each other. 
there used to be a saying about the uh, black white um, friendship thing between the north and the south they used to say that in the north the blacks were loved by the whites in general but in the south they were loved specifically every child had been raised by a sweet black lady they loved and yet in general the whites were sort of over the blacks but as individuals they loved each other they were friends where in the North, they didn't know each other that well, and they kept the slave versus the owner separate. And they said, well, we're not better than them. We're just different. But there, was, there wasn't the years of having black mamas raise your babies. And so there was love and friendship among the people, even though politically there was this potential if we ever got in a war. Uh, so they asked them for jewelry and clothing. And you say, what in the world? Well, you remember when they finally got around to making the tabernacle? Remember the high priest? He had this breastplate right here, and it had 12 jewels on it. He had an onyx here and an onyx there. Where do you think that came from? They're out in the desert. Well, God had all that in his mind ahead of time. And so here they are, and uh, they have asked for jewelry, and they've asked for clothing. All that fine linen and all of the things for the priestly garments, where did that come from? Well, they had asked, uh, and the Lord gave the people favor with the, with the Egyptian site, that they gave them what they requested. And in that way, they plundered the Egyptians to plunder is when you go into war, the person who wins takes all the good stuff, everything but the gold in their teeth. You take off their watch, you take off their rings, you take off anything of value if you're in a war. They didn't have to go to war. All they asked for was give us jewelry and fine garments, and they did. So they took that with them. The Israelites traveled from Ramesses to Sukkoth. Ramesses is, well, if you go now, Ramesses is where they have um, the big King Tut's tomb and um, uh, the main pyramids and that lion thing out there. And it's very close to the land of Goshen. Uh, about 600,000 soldiers on foot besides their families. An ethnically diverse crowd also went with them, and a huge number of livestock, flocks, herds. The time that the Israelites lived in Europe was, in Egypt, was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that same day, all the divisions of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The same night is in honor of the Lord, a night vigil for all the Israelites throughout uh, their generations. I'm going to leave it there, except let me read maybe a sentence or two. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. For a foreigner resides with you, and wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover, every male in the house must be circumcised. Uh, and if you're going to have a foreigner come in and he wants to live with you, he can live with you. He's got to be circumcised also. Now, he doesn't have to live with you. He doesn't have to be in your house. You can't say, well, you're going to make him change his religion? Look, nobody's forcing anybody to do anything. You don't have to live with a Jewish family. But if you do, you've got to convert to their religion, at least outwardly. Um, and you know the rest of that story. 
I'm going now to when Jesus celebrated that. He told them, you're going to do this um, every year as long as there's a Jew alive. Now, Jesus was going to be hung on the cross on a Friday. Now, normally this meal would be celebrated on a Friday. But at the end of the day on Friday, you know, Saturday starts the minute the sun goes down on Friday. So Friday, about 6, 6.30, it becomes Saturday. That was to be the day they were going to sell, celebrate this feast of the Passover. But, of course, Jesus knew what he would be doing on that day. So the day before, he instructed his disciples what to do. Um, let me see. I thought I had. Here we go. Judas had gone and made a deal. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was drawing nigh. So the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put him to death because they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. He was numbered with the twelve. He was one of the twelve disciples. Satan entered into it. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and the temple police how he could hand him over. They were glad and agreed to give him silver, so he accepted the offer. They started looking for a good opportunity to betray him when the crowd was not present. You'll remember from past lessons, Jesus was very popular. No way the Roman guards could have arrested him in the daytime when there were people around. They would have pulled the guards right off of him. What did they need Judas for? They needed, I uh, hear the birds are coming up now, huh? They wouldn't get out of the kitchen before, but I see they're both up there now. I can only see one, but they're both up there. Yeah, guys, come on. Yeah, I guess you're a little closer. I don't want you too close because I don't want you jumping on my shoulder. Only an insider would know exactly where would be Jesus at night, and they had to come and find him at night and they'd rest him by night because they couldn't do it during the day. Jesus was too popular to be. He healed the people that were sick, provided food when they needed it. They loved it. They needed Judas. They needed an insider to say, where's Jesus going to be tonight about midnight? So he accepted the offer. And he started looking for a good way to betray him. Then the day of unleavened bread came. Well, that would be after in the morning. Uh, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us so we can eat it. Where do you want us to prepare it, they said. He said, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Usually women were carrying the water jug. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owner of that house, the teacher, the master, says, where is the guest room where I can eat Passover with my disciples? Then he'll show you a large furnished room upstairs, and you make the preparations there. So they went, and then they found it, like he said, and they prepared the Passover. Like every Jew does every year. When the hour came, 
Eucharistie. It's now not going to be Passover. It's going to be the Lord's Supper. When the hour came, he reclined at the table. They didn't sit at the table. Remember how the first Passover was? They had their inner garment, their outer garment, their coats on. The women had a shawl, and inside of the shawl was wrapped a bowl with the with the bread they were going to cook along the road on the way, wrapped in the shawl. They were standing up with their sandals on, eating. Each one of those things had meaning. And they reclined. It was kind of like a lawn chair. And they kind of, the table was there, the food was on it, and they just, you know, relaxed around the table. And the apostles were with them. Verse 15. I'm in the 22nd chapter of Luke. I fervently desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, this is my last Passover. I'm going to eat it again but not here on earth. When I come in the clouds for you, I'm going to come and get you, and we're going to have a Passover meal, but not on this earth. Then he took a cup, and... Um, Mine happens to have, um, happens to be a candle. But it's the kind you usually see in, in pictures. And he took the cup. Now, normally they drink wine. Because unless you were in your own home where you had a pure water source, you there just wasn't good pure water available. And because there were, they had like cider, which is the wine of um, uh, apples, which is the last thing Jesus drank on the cross. He took the cup. And it was actually larger than this. This is an individual cup. This was larger because they, he would take a drink and he would pass it to the next one. And they would take a drink and then they would pass it to the next one. He took a cup and he gave thanks. In other words, he offered a prayer. Thank you, Father. Take this and share it among yourselves. Take it. This is for all of you. Among all of you. I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. We Christians call this the fruit of the vine because we use grape juice. We have no need to use wine. Uh, water would have been preferable. Uh, the grape juice would have been preferable. But it would start to ferment. So it was probably wine that they had. We use grape juice because we can. Um, we don't have that problem now. And because anything alcoholic has the potential for uh, abuse. You all have heard me say that I had one parent who had an addictive personality. And if you could get addicted to anything and she got any of it in her, she became addicted to it. And that's why I am so afraid of, <laughs> of anything that can be addictive that I'm even afraid sometimes to try a new medicine that the doctor might give me. Because I know that I have some of her DNA in my DNA. And there are 
so I'm concerned about it. But he took it, and he said, take this cup and share it. I won't drink it again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took it, and he gave thanks. And then he took bread. Now, this is leavened bread. And this, of course, is a hot dog bun because it's what I had in my refrigerator. But again, the idea was, take some off. And then, pass it on. This isn't the way we celebrate it now. And it's not the way that the Apostle Paul and Christians celebrated it in those days either. But that's how he celebrated it with them. He took the... Um, he said, when he took the cup, he said, this is my blood that shed for you. When he took the bread, he said, this is my body that's broken for you. My blood will be spilled. My body will be broken. Do this and do it. He said, this isn't the last time. I'm not going to take it again here on earth, but you are. And when you do this, do this in memory of me. This is the cup of the new covenant established by my blood. We had an old covenant. We had an old contract. You sinned. A high priest would confess it to God. A lamb would be killed. The blood would be spilled out. Your sins would be covered for a year. That's the contract Jesus had with the Jews for 2,000 years. But he said, now we've got a new covenant. We have a new agreement. We have a new contract. The cup is the new covenant established by my blood, which was which is shed for you, will be on the next morning. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it's been determined, but woe to this man who betrayed me. So they all started arguing among themselves. Which one? Who? Who? who, who who's betraying him? There's a song. I wish I had the keyboard over here, but uh, we're already an hour into this video. I'll sing it to you next week. What I want to tell you now is that next Sunday... I will prepare, and I have something here. Let me put this back where it was. I have a picture. Just going to turn the tablet on. If you are not one of the regulars, anyway. that goes to church regularly and has an opportunity to take communion and you would like to you can do that next Sunday morning by doing the following and I'm looking for a picture here that I 
uh, here we go. This is what you can do if you would like to take communion. You need a small amount of grape juice. Very small. When the disciples and the new Christians during the first 100 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, they used to sell a whole meal. They used to have a whole meal. But then they got to where some people wanted to eat first and they thought they were better than the ones that ate second. Some of them, their kids ate too much. And finally the apostles looked and said, look, you didn't come here to fill up your stomachs. You came out here to remember what the Lord did for you. Eat at home. What we're going to do now, we do in remembrance. So we're not going to drink a whole cup of grape juice. And we're not going to eat a whole roll of bread. What we're going to do is we're going to have a small portion of it because it's not the actual eating of it. It is that we're doing it in remembrance of him. So this is the size of the uh, cup and most Christians who prepare their own now, we ministers have places where we can go and buy these things or most of us just go out and buy crackers. If you don't make the tortillas, you're not absolutely sure what's in it. The matzo bread you can't find everywhere, but anywhere you go, you can find a cracker. And you can buy just uh, for usually under a dollar a, a single size of just grape juice. I get a kind that's sparkling, two for a dollar at the 99 cent store, but it's because I have it for my guests. Uh, but it's just grape juice. It, the water happens to be sparkling, or, or this is just the kind of grape juice that you're offered in a restaurant for breakfast. Do you want grape juice or, or orange juice? And if you would like to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I'll give you instructions then on how it's taken and uh, the prayer that is prayed before taking it and all of that. Um, you don't have to know what you're doing. I will explain it to you and you'll be safe. You'll be okay. But because we're not in the same place, I can't prepare it for you. But that's the size. You just, you can have a tiny bit, like I have a, a little bit here in my glass of something. I just have it at the desk with me because most people don't have little cups like that. Uh, just the corner of a cracker and a couple tablespoons of grape juice is all you need. And that will be a week from today. Now, I'm going to close the video. So give me just a moment. Our next video will be made tonight. And until the next video... Blessings on you.